Thank you, Celebration. Thank you, House Band. Wonderful job. As, as always. Uh, Reverend Cherie, as she said last week, has stepped away for a little break, so I'm here today to uh, give the message, and we'll see how that goes. Oh, that's going to work. Thanks, Brian. Thanks so much. This is in case I get tired and have to sit down. So, so many people have asked, why in the parable of the big toe? What's this all about? The why is going to be a, a very quick run through based, in the, based on the unity, our five unity principles. And it's why have a spiritual path? And if I'm, if I'm on a spiritual path, why, why choose unity? So very quickly, I'm going to try to run through, tiptoe through the principles to try to paint a picture as to why. Now, the second part, the longer part, the parable of the big toe, and some of you know about this, I know, is an example, a personal example, of the five principles at work in my life several years ago. And we're going to leave it at that for right now. A positive path to spiritual living. How many of you know what that is? That's unity's, unity, the unity movement's tagline. And I want to draw your attention to just a couple of things about that very short and powerful phrase. It's not the positive path to spiritual living. And there's a big clue in why it's not the, it's an ah. As you heard in our mission today, all paths lead to God. So this is one of the paths that you're free to choose. It's a positive path. And I got to tell you a story. We had, we had started coming to Unity several years, oh, 10 years ago now. And I brought a, I brought a I'm going to say friend or relative, so I don't give away their identity. And the friend or relative after the service came up to me and said, you know, I really, it was a good message, friendly people, but you all are just too happy. You're too positive. And I, I, it took me back a little bit. It's like, well, wow, too positive? That's because we enjoy being with one another and we enjoy the framework with which you, from which unity teaches. So it's a positive path for spiritual living. Three of our principles has to, have to do with living the principles. And, I'll, and I, hopefully I'll make that clear to you once I get to that. And that's a clue to the parable of the big toe. I'll say no more about that. Pay attention to the floor lamp. Pay attention to the floor lamp. I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking I was going to get a laugh for this stuff. Um, this book, The Five Principles by Reverend Ellen Devonport. As many of you know, we use this book in our, in our Path to Discovery class, which is our new persons class. To me, it's a sentinel book that explains in 21st century terms what our five principles are all about. And I use it extensively, and I will use it extensively in today's, the first part of today's talk. My second source of inspiration comes from a movie, a 1977 movie, which was entitled, Oh God. How many of you remember Oh God? Who was God? George Burns. Who was the person he chose to be his messenger? John Denver and John Denver's wife, Terry Garr. Now, I, I use this as a reference a little bit tongue in cheek, but I can tell you in 1977 or 78 when I first saw that movie, there were so many unity-like little messages buried in that movie that it resonated with me, not even knowing there was such a thing as unity at the time. But it was like, oh, I like what they say. And I'm going to give you a couple of quotes. George Burns says, God, he's in a discussion with, uh, with John Dever, and he goes, ah, religion, that's easy. Faith is more of a challenge. What's in my heart is more of a challenge. John Denver saying, why did you choose me? I don't even belong to a church. And God's answer is, neither do I. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And uh, how many of you are David, Dr. David Hawkins fans out here? Oh, quite a few. Okay. God, George Burns is talking about, you know, he's made some mistakes along the way. And he says, shame, which is a Dr. David Hawkins 
vibration level, one of the lowest. Shame was a goof. It serves no purpose at all. No purpose whatsoever. And lastly, cows were an afterthought. I just thought mothers needed a break. <laughs> so as I get to the principles, I'm gonna to introduce to you a term that's not up there, and I'm not, not on a slide. It's called GATB. How many of you know what GATB means? The gospel according to Bob. <laughs> Take it for what it is. It's just my thought about the five principles, my thought about this occurrence in my life. It's based in what I believe and practice for myself, but it's not. You're, you're free to completely disagree with me, by the way. Ellen has two quotes that I'd like to draw your attention to. And it's kind of, they're interesting. These are from the book, The Five Principles. The older I get, the more I believe that finding some kind of spiritual path is a quality of life issue. A quality of life issue. It's not about a rigidity issue, about learning all the rules and regulations. It's that if I'm on a spiritual path that I vibrate with, that I resonate with, it improves the very quality of my life. I can be more at peace with who I am and who, who others in my life are and broader. And secondly, the point of a spiritual growth then is to know myself as spirit, myself as spirit. This hits right at principle two and express it in my life. By the way, if, if any of you were listening to John's prayer, he went through each of the five principles almost word for word, and a wonderful job. John, you did my job for me, really, for this first part of the talk. Principle, so we talk about the five principles. What do we mean by principle? A fundamental source or basis of something that never changes. And I'm gonna go on and read. Laws of the universe that apply to all people all the time. Like mathematics or aerodynamics, we can learn how to use them to great advantage or not. So let's think about aerodynamics. In this three-dimensional time-based world we live in, the principle of aerodynamics was always at work given gravity and given air that we this, on this earth. Birds flew for as long as there were birds. But man only figured out how to put aerodynamics to their best and highest use about 120 years ago. So the principle is aerodynamics exists, but when we learn how to use aerodynamics using a natural law example, it's to our advantage, to our advantage. These are the, the five principles in a nutshell. These are Ellen Debenport's chapter titles. God is all, you are God, co-create with God, commune with God and expressing God. Now, when I go through these, the first two are more fundamental in nature. By the, way, by the way, this is gospel according to Bob. The last three are practices. Once we, once we bed the first two down, you, God is all. All that we know and don't know, all that we see and unseen. It's all God, and God is principle. It's a different God than what we might read when we look at the Hebrew scriptures a kind of a changeable God, uh, 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 could be, you know, uh, change attitude, played favorites, what, this, this people versus this people. When we say God, it's God is principle. It is always at work, always available to us, unchanging, unwavering, not only to us on this earth, but in the entire universe, the creator of all. Here's an interesting little factoid that Ellen brings out in her book. So, Science would tell us that the, the universe is about 14 billion years old. Does that ring true with most people? Use that number, 14 billion. So if we index the 14 billion to 100 years, so okay, now the framework has gone from 14 billion to 100 years. 14 billion equals 100 years. Earth has only been around for 33 of those 100 years. And Homo sapiens have been around for about a day. Now, the premise of God as principle means that God's been around for at least those 14 billion years and probably before that. So we're rather new at this creation thing. God is absolute good everywhere present. Principle two, you are God, a pretty bold statement. But what we mean by that is human beings, because we're part of the universe, we're an integral part of the universe. 
If God is all and God is, a, is good in the absolute sense, then we too, we too, being part of the universe, have a spark of divinity in, in them, and we call that the Christ within. Jesus Christ, it was Jesus Christ, Christ meaning the anointed one. So we have that Christ spirit within us. Our very essence of, of, is of God, and therefore we are inherently good. Now this is where the unity principle kind of takes traditional Christianity and turns it on its ear a little bit. It really does. This is the first point of, oh, this is, diff this is really different. We are not born in sin. We are not born flawed. We are born with the Spirit of God within us. We are inherently good. Now, here's the trick, the catch. We can forget that. We can forget that as we go throughout our lives, day by day and day by day, and see ourselves as separate, separate from God, separate from one another. And therein lies a first learning. By the way, I'm going really quick through this stuff because time is of the essence because we live in a time-based existence. Okay, let's lighten it up a little bit. In Ellen's book, she uses this acronym, B-E-S-S. -S. It's not B-S. It's B-E-S-S, -S. and she think, and she describes it as uh, Russian nesting dolls, which is what this is supposed to depict. And she says, look, from a spiritual perspective, there are four components to us human beings. Two are temporary, temporary and two are eternal. The smallest nesting doll, B, stands for body. It's temporal. It's going to be here for somewhere, probably no longer than 110 years, and it will go away. We take care of it, but it's not forever. Death, bodily death, occurs. Okay? The E, anybody guess what E stands for? Ego. So ego, ego, and let me, let me read this because ego which in its healthy state gives us focus and confidence to function in the human world. Ego in its healthy state gives us focus and confidence to function in the world. It's here to protect the body from all the dangers that exist in our world. Here's the, here's the thing. Unless we're aware of this, the ego is in charge all the time. All the time if we're not careful which is where the second two parts come in. S is our soul, and, and the second S is spirit. Soul being our individualized expression of God in us, my soul, where I feel things. And spirit is that actual spark of divinity that resides in me, that inspires the soul. Now, I can go on and on and talk about this, but I don't have, I don't have the luxury of time. The purpose of a spiritual path is to recognize this interplay of ego and soul, the two components that make up ego being per the personality and soul being our inspired self. The soul, we are a soul, it will last forever, forever and ever. The ego is more attached to the body, it's trying to protect the body. And the whole point of a spiritual path is to have the soul let the ego know that I think and feel and act from a soul perspective, letting the ego do what it does best, just protect the body and not control our lives. Does it follow? I'm, good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad some of you said yes because I have to move on anyways. Now we come to the three practices, and I'm going to go very quickly through these. The three practices are getting our thoughts a lot. So, okay, let me back up. Using principles one and two, God is all, and I too am God. Now I start to need to put that in practice. The first being, get my thoughts aligned with my soul self and away from my ego self. I am a co-creator. I am a co-creator with the divine within me. So as John said in his prayer, however I'm thinking, feeling, and however I see the world is the world that shows up for me. 
if I think positively, if I see the gift in even, even those challenges, I will see the positive aspect of even what may appear to be a not so positive thing. There's a story about an old man walking on a path between two cities, right? I don't think this is in the Bible, but it's kind of sounds and feels like a Bible story. And he comes, a couple coming the opposite direction. And the old man, uh, the couple says, hi, old man, uh, we're going from that city to this city. Can you tell us anything about the city that we're going to? And the old man says, well, tell me, how did you find the people in the city you're leaving? And the, and the couple says, oh, they were horrible people. They were nasty. We didn't get along with anybody. Just, just a terrible experience, which is why we're leaving that city and going to the next. So what can you tell us about the new city? The old man says, I'm afraid to tell you, you're going to find people just like the ones you left. <laughs> and guess what happens to the second couple that comes along from the same city? They were wonderful. We had a great time. We're just looking for new opportunities in the new city. Those are the people you will find. That is the essence of co-creating with God. What, however our outlook, whatever, however we paint the world with our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, whatever we focus on, that is what we will e experience and see in the world. So there's a lot of work to try to get in front of those thoughts and feelings, those ingrained reactions. I'm gonna use the term first responder in the parable of the big toe. I'm not gonna use the, the term first reactor. Can you imagine if first responders were actually first reactors? Oh my God, I can't believe that happened to you. No, they're trained. They're trained to take in the environment and then give a trained response to whatever it is, whatever it is they see. Number four, prayer and meditation. So, God is all. You are God. I've done my work with my thoughts and feelings. I got them aligned. But you know what? My ego and soul still might be in a little bit of tussle there on who's in control and where do I come from. This is aligning. Aligning my ego soul thing with the divine. Through prayer, which I typically call uploading, or meditation, which is typically in silent, which is where I'm downloading. I'm looking for the message from God. Upload, download, prayer, meditation. There are many barriers to having a prayer practice and a meditation practice. I would say my advice, my, my thought for each of you is start small. If you don't have a practice today, start small. Say thank, thank you is a prayer. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the opportunity. But live in gratitude and thankfulness. Start there and your practice will develop. Okay, so now I've done all the consciousness work. God is all. I am God. I co-create with that God. I can commune with God. Now is when I'm ready to step into this world and be in service, take action in this world, whether it's being active or whether it's just holding, holding a higher level of consciousness. But this is after I've done all my consciousness work, I'm now prepared to step into this world, centered, aligned with the divine in all of us. Knowing and understanding these laws of life, all so-called truth is not enough. We must live from them. That's what I just said. So takeaways. Unity teachings don't give you all the answers. The answers are all within you. Because you, guess what? You're all co-creators with the divine. But they do provide a framework from which I can explore those answers. Not rigid answers, but what, is, what works for me. One and oneness, that's God and I am. God is, I am, universally. No exceptions. We are all part of the universe. And lastly, practice. Those last three co-creating with God through thoughts and feelings, communing with God in prayer and meditation, and lastly, stepping into the world to practice. Okay. That's it. That's, that's the whirlwind of the, of the principles. Now, this has to come off for the next part. Three wise men 
and six miracles are going to be part of this story. And I will signal with this chime when one of those things happens. It was November 24th, 2014. It was the Monday before Thanksgiving. And we had bought a lamp that looked a lot like that one. It was unassembled. So that Monday morning, my wife Donna had gone to a exercise class. I was home alone. It's time to put that thing together. <sighs> and so I started. It came in a box. The box was about yay high, yay wide like this. I'm in my garage. I'm actually in my jammies, which were cotton shirt, cotton shorts, socks, and a t-shirt. In my garage, concrete floor, and I start to disassemble the box. It's one of those, it's a box within a box, so there's a sleeve that you pick up. So here I am, about 8.30 in the morning. I'm taking the top box off, and just about here, I realize something far too late. That base of that lamp is a 23-pound weight. The 23-pound weight was right here at my eye level, and directly below it was my left big toe. <laughs> and it fell. And it fell, and I instantly felt the pain. I went like this, and I hopped in to my uh, kitchen, called, called Donna, no answer, called my next-door neighbor, John. I said, John, I need help. I've really hurt myself badly. Can you come over? Well, sure, right away. What happened? I hurt my big toe. <laughs> okay. With that, I grabbed it, and I heard a sound that I never really wanted to hear when I grabbed it. The, the sock was discolored. I hopped back out to the garage, and I lay down. John comes over. So let, what's, what's with the big toe? I said, John, it's, it's hurt really bad. What do you want me to do? I said, I don't know. I don't know, but it's really, it really, I think I really hurt it bad. He said, well, I said, let's call 911. 911? It's a big toe. He did. And he sat with me actually on the concrete floor as I dealt with the pain and then a little bit of... Um, shock, I think. John was my first wise man. He provided comfort when I couldn't turn anywhere else. So, 911, who's the first responder? First responder to come. It's a fireman. So he comes around the open garage door where I'm laying. So where's the guy with the big hurt toe? That'd be me. That'd be me. Let's take a look at, oh, oh, the EMTs will be here right away. They're right behind me. He provided comfort as well. Three minutes later, here comes the EMT. So where's the guy with the big hurt toe? Oh, buddy, you need pain meds, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that would be helpful. He administered pain meds. That was my third wise man. Actually, there are four wise men. There's still one to come. So what do you want to, where do you want to go? You called 911? Yeah, your toes hurt pretty badly. Where do you want to go? I said, I have no idea. I have no idea. First miracle. Well, oh, I forgot a miracle already. So as I'm laying there, before the firemen arrived, I'm laying there and I'm doing this. Oh, how stupid can you be? Why did this have to happen to me? Why did I lift it that way? Oh, I'm never going to walk again. I don't know what's going to happen. And, and right then, through my training and experience at this place, I had an epiphany. Bob? Whatever happens is going to be for your highest and best. There's a gift in this. God is with me. I, am co I will co-create the solution with me together. And instantly, the fear, the anxiety, not the pain, 
but the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty, it went away. It went away. I trusted my faith. My, te- my, my, my work here at this church taught me to release all that. And I did. So anyways, where do you want to go, buddy? Back to the ambulance. He goes, you know what? That toe is pretty well destroyed. You need to go to a trauma center. Not an ER, a trauma center. You've got vascular damage. You've got obviously structural damage. You've got a lot of flesh. That toe needs a class A trauma center. We're going to Round Rock because Breckenridge at the time was just overwhelmed. So for Round Rock, we went. I don't remember much about it because at that time the pain meds were working well. <laughs> they were working well. I was, I was conscious but not really aware. Pull into the ER, or the, yeah, the ER at the trauma center and get wheeled into a place and I'm laying there and still feeling pretty good. <laughs> and Dr. Jeff walks into the uh, ER. Where's the guy with the big hurt too? <laughs> Be me. Dr. Jeff says, well, today is your good fortune day. I'm a doctor that specializes in feet. (laughs) He was the ER doctor for the whole trauma center, but he was a doctor that specialized in feet. He took a look at it and says, you know what? There's a 50-50 chance that that toe stays or goes. But we're going to operate and I'm going to do my best. I said, Doc, you know, I didn't say Doc. I, I... Doctor, I think I said, I'll trust that whatever you do will be for my highest and best, and I know you'll be guided. Those principles at work. At work. So anyways, I get operated on, and then the recovery takes place, and Dr. Jeff comes out and goes, look, you come back Thanksgiving morning. Here's here's the deal. Pink is good. Gray is not good, meaning the color of my skin. He had, he had sewn it up, put it back together. So Thanksgiving morning rolls around. We, Don and I go to Dr. Jeff. We're out, the only three in the whole building. Dr. Jeff starts unwrapping. And I start like, well, okay, here we go. Number one, it hurt. Because it was throbbing like crazy. And here's what happened. He un- unfurled the last roll. And this is what happened. <laughs> It's pink. It's pink. <laughs> Dr. Jeff went back crazy. I almost said another word. He, it was like he was overjoyed. He couldn't believe, he couldn't believe that it was all pink. He said, your toe, your toe will re- regrow. <laughs> he later confided in us. He thought the chances were more like 1090. I held on to 50-50 thinking that was great, you know. (laughs) My toe is solid today. (laughs) It wasn't wasn't me. It was, I believe, it was the miracles that occurred throughout that episode that allowed me to heal, to get my toe restored. Now, my toenail actually is on the side of my toe. Not on the top. But that's because that's the way the, the skin had to come back together. So it's a little funky looking when I go swimming. <sighs> that's about it, folks. <laughs> the parable of the big toe. My takeaways, going back to this slide, it's all that. Be careful when opening floor lamp boxes or wear steel, steel, steel-toed shoes. But in seriousness, be kind to yourself and one another. Forgive, live in gratitude and thanksgiving for yourself and each other. Walk your path with ease and grace. You are never alone. Thanks.